Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Healthcare for the Homeless Models of Integrated Care. My name is Julie Hashida, and I'll be acting as moderator for today's webinar, which is a production of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration Office of Special Population Health. This is a one-hour presentation with the last 10 minutes reserved for Q&A. A selected number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. I now turn the mic over to our MC, Dr. Barbara DiPietro. Barbara? Thank you, Julie. I appreciate everyone attending today. As we know, integrated care is getting a lot of attention nationally uh, and how we're moving our healthcare system forward. Uh, our panel of presenters today, we've got uh, folks from around the country who are really looking at what integrated care looks like in their communities and for their HCH Health Center and have approached this from a variety of standpoints. Today we'll get a chance to hear about what that looks like and then at the end, as Julie had said, to ask a few questions. So be thinking about how some of these models might apply to the situation that you're currently working with. Uh, we'll begin with Claire Goyer, who is the Council's Technical Assistance Coordinator. Claire comes to us from the HCH in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Also would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Alan Ainsworth, who is the Executive Director at the Salt Lake City Healthcare for the Homeless in Utah. Then we have Dr. David Buck, a physician who is President of the Healthcare for the Homeless in Houston. And finally, Dr. Pia Valvasori, uh, a clinician and nurse at the Healthcare for the Homeless in Orlando, Florida. An overview of today's presentation, we want to just take a little bit of time to explain how we've gotten where we are in our history of integrated care, the models that are currently being presented in uh, in the country and uh, what those models might look like as a structural framework. Uh, the current goals on where we're trying to go nationally, some key terms that people use so that we're, st we're straight in, in how we're characterizing what we're talking about. And then uh, Claire will talk about uh, some upcoming publications that the Council will be putting forward. From there, we'll move to Dr. Ainsworth, who will present an administrator's perspective and the things that one might think of from an administrative perspective in how an integrated care model might be implemented, and then moving from there to two clinical examples uh, and perspectives that would include patient examples and what that care might look like. And then again, finally, we will we'll finish with some questions and answers. Uh, with that as a quick overview and a highlight of what's to come, uh, we'll get to it, and I'll turn it over to Claire. Thank you, Barbara. Historically, we have had mental health, substance abuse, and primary care service providers who have developed programs in alignment with their particular specialties and staffed these programs with licensed staff specific to their expert disciplines. In many communities, services have taken the form of standalone models of care and required the individual consumer to move from one service setting to another. Often the consumer was seen in the arena of the specific diagnosis or symptom for example, substance use disorders were treated quite separately from mental health issues, and primary care focused on medical symptoms and diseases only, with referrals sometimes but not consistently made across these settings. For persons experiencing homelessness, this fragmentation adds another layer of barriers in addressing the often trimorbid conditions which are present, and generally results in a lack of access to all needed areas of care. As health care for the homeless providers, we have been in the forefront of both providing and advocating for care coordination across systems, recognizing that our clients' health outcomes will only be improved through a focus on the whole person, starting where the person is ready to start, providing our care in the spirit of teamwork, and closely coordinating with a wide range of community resources. In other words, person-centered care. Healthcare reform in our country is focused on access, quality, and cost controls. A key strategy to addressing all of these challenges is movement toward person-centered care. Person-centered care has its focus on the person with an illness 
and not on the disease in the person. Other characteristics include using the person's own experiences as the point of departure, striving to understand behaviors and symptoms from the perspective of the person, tailoring care and treatment to each individual, promoting both patient empowerment and shared decision making, involving the patient as an active collaborative partner, and striving to involve the person's social network in his or her care. As previously noted, these principles are in complete alignment with the healthcare for the homeless model of care. A critical strategy to implementing person-centered care is integrating care modalities. I like to think of integration as a shared lens and partnership with the patient, which addresses the whole person with common language, and common language is generally accomplished through the use of a, a consistently applied evidence-based practices. And treatment planning and outcomes management conducted by a team, which, in, which includes the patient. As HCH providers, we have historically been on the cutting edge of person-centered care. And it is important that we both recognize <clears throat> and uh, appreciate the key elements that have made our work so successful with persons who often have significant and multiple challenges, and to align these principles of care with other health reform efforts which are underway, such as patient-centered medical home recognition. In fact, we believe that we can be recognized as a true model for a person-centered health home. Working with an advisory committee of council members, the Council is currently working on a technical assistance document for the field, which will outline the key elements of integrated care for persons experiencing homelessness. This document will outline all of the strategies which we employ in the field to ensure access to care and comprehensive and integrated service models. One key component of this project will be a field review with at least 10 separate healthcare for the homeless sites, representing a wide range of organization and service types, as well as integration models and program longevity. We will be exploring both examples of best practice as well as challenges to integration and examining the alignment between the healthcare for the homeless model of care and the movement toward patient-centered health homes. The final document will also include resources relevant to patient-centered medical home recognition, meaningful use, and policy development and advocacy. We anticipate that this document will be available in the fall of 2011. I would now like to hand off to Alan Ainsworth, who will describe the Salt Lake City, Utah HCH program and who will address the development of an integrated care model from an administrator's perspective. Alan? Thank you, Claire. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to uh, present today. Uh, also, I want to take just a second to, to uh, express my thanks to the staff. Uh, this has been a very uh, uh, interesting process to be part of. Uh, it is a lot trickier than it appears on the surface. So with that having been said, uh, I'll go to the next slide and talk about how we got into uh, integration of behavioral health and primary health care. Um, you notice uh, on the, the top of the first slide uh, that I, I state that uh, more than 70 percent of prescriptions for behavioral health medications are written by primary care providers. I since have uh, come to understand that it's almost 90 percent at this point nationwide. Uh, this has been a real problem for primary care providers because they're often uh, uh, insufficiently trained as uh, uh, diagnosticians. Uh, they feel like they're in over their heads, uh, they're not comfortable uh, dealing with uh, mental health issues because of lack of training, they don't really know how to prescribe well. So uh, I, I would uh, state from an administrator's perspective that uh, the ability to integrate behavioral health and primary health care is actually a recruitment and retention tool in addition to better serving our patients' needs. So um, you notice that um, uh, when uh, your providers are trying to hand off uh, uh, patients that they feel are mentally ill, uh, have some uh, some suspected diagnosis that uh, 
often the system fails. Uh, here in Salt Lake City, for example, uh, we have a very large mental health uh, uh, community, uh, a community mental health system. They no longer accept people who do not uh, receive Medicaid uh, or other third-party insurance, so uh, we could uh, <clears throat> re refer to them until we were blue in the face, but uh, not have them accepted into the system. So as a result of the immense frustration that our providers had with the combination of uh, being in the position of trying to treat patients who had a mental illness, uh, even if it was a, a, a very mild acute uh, depression, for example, uh, they, they were very frustrated that they could not adequately provide health care without uh, being able to refer someone to the mental health system and have that, that uh, issue uh, dealt with and then uh, have them understand what was going on from that perspective. So <clears throat> we took um, the opportunity uh, in Salt Lake City to um, apply for one of the first demonstration grants that uh, uh, the Bureau of Primary Health Care uh, uh, released uh, uh, about right, approximately 10 years ago. They uh, suggested that they would fund as many as 10 demonstration grants to uh, test whether uh, the integration of behavioral health and primary health care in community health care settings was appropriate, and we were fortunate enough to be one of the 10 to be funded. Uh, I'm always apprehensive about moving into uh, demonstration grants with the anticipation of perhaps having to uh, uh, do a reduction in force at the end of the, of the demonstration money. Uh, fortunately, this money was rolled into our base funding, so we have been uh, uh, at a terrible disadvantage over some other community health centers, uh, uh, a terrible advantage uh, in that uh, we continue to have the uh, behavioral health money uh, given to us uh, through our base grant. Uh, and we've also gone through a, uh, uh, a, a transition in the way we've done this. Um, but before I get to that, let me talk about uh, the uh, issue of having an on-site pharmacy as well. Um, we decided uh, at the same time that we were moving towards uh, the uh, integration of behavioral health that we also were, were grappling with the pharmacy issue. So roughly the same time that we started our behavioral health program, we also added an on-site pharmacy, which has proved to be extremely helpful to us over the, over the time period. So uh, we started out slowly in our behavioral health program. Uh, our initial uh, idea was to uh, hire a, uh, uh, a licensed social worker, and uh, we found out fairly quickly that uh, this was not going to be adequate for our purposes. Uh, as soon as we could, we moved uh, towards a uh, psychiatrist uh, who is also a, uh, a she, she's both a, an adult and child psychiatrist and a pediatrician. Um, she now supervises a, a, an advanced practice registered nurse, also called a site nurse, uh, who has essentially got us to the real integration point that we were, we were searching for. Uh, this person uh, behaves uh, virtually like a uh, primary care physician, uh, pr provider uh, sitting in the same area at, as our other primary care providers do. Uh, they um, have prescriptive privileges, obviously. Uh, as our patients come in, uh, uh, our primary care providers uh, uh, carefully begin the primary care uh, process uh, of uh, assessing and diagnosing, including assessing the possibility of mental health issues. Uh, during the course of that visit, they do a, a warm handoff to the advanced practice registered nurse. Uh, that person uh, then uh, sets up an appointment with the, uh, with the patient patient comes back in for a subsequent appointment, uh, an assessment and diagnosis are done, uh, initial prescriptions are written, uh, those prescriptions are sent to our, our, our on-site pharmacy, uh, and then the primary care provider continues to be the central team player in uh, the patient-centered uh, care that Claire was talking about earlier. Uh, there is a constant dialogue between the primary health care provider and the uh, advanced practice registered nurse in terms of uh, progress that the patient is making. Uh, you'll see on this slide that we're also in incorporating both uh, psychiatry residents and uh, psychology and uh, social work students in this process. Uh, they get a chance to see how our uh, system works and to get experience in, in working in this setting, which we think is very uh, important to us as well. Um, we, we use a um, uh, a, a, uh, an open access process for the majority of our patients, which means that people pretty much have to get an appointment the day before or the day of uh, uh, that they want to be served. 
We make an exception with our advanced practice registered nurse in that uh, he has certain slots set aside each day to see people. Uh, the advantage to the patient is that they don't have to, to uh, travel long distances or even short distances to get uh, mental health services from us, uh, and they don't have to worry about having to pay for prescriptions. Uh, our prescriptions are all offered free through uh, the indigent drug programs that we have set up through the various drug companies. So we've tried to lower as many barriers as possible and increase access to behavioral health. Uh, I will say that uh, the recruitment and retention process uh, that we have experienced uh, since adopting this new model has been extremely uh, successful. Uh, our providers now tell me that they no longer ever want to work in a setting that doesn't have integrated behavioral health and an on-site pharmacy. Uh, knowing that that's very difficult to put together, uh, it's uh, still something that I think uh, we should all be striving for. So uh, um, we are looking more towards the linkage of diabetes and depression, and we're beginning to pro provide a group counseling on site. Uh, we have also incorporated something called outcome questionnaires and youth outcome questionnaires, if, as you'll see on the next slide. Uh, this is a product that was actually uh, developed by a local uh, psychiatrist at uh, the, uh, Brigham Young University, which is south of Salt Lake City in Provo. Uh, and uh, I will say that it has not been validated for use in the homeless setting, but we are, uh, have, having searched for other uh, alternatives, we found that this to be the, the, the better alternative, so something like the uh, P PHQ-9 that some of you may be using. It's a little bit longer uh, process. Patients can either go to a computer kiosk and uh, input their, their information, or if they don't feel comfortable doing that, or if they're not literate, we uh, help them uh, uh, in a very relativistic way. So uh, we consider that uh, the integration of primary health services uh, are, is a crucial uh, step for additional expertise uh, uh, in supporting our primary care providers, linking the patient with uh, the assistance that they need, and uh, then uh, doing additional um, patient education even through our pharmacy so that they, they uh, better understand the interactions of the drugs that they're taking, uh, what drugs uh, can be substituted as necessary. Uh, having said all that, so we serve roughly 6,000 patients each year. Uh, we are doing more and more outreach. We now have a full-time outreach provider. Our uh, advanced practice registered nurse goes out a half day a week uh, to camps and uh, abandoned buildings and so forth with our outreach uh, provider. And uh, we're, we're attempting to uh, build trust with people who may not have been patients of ours in the past, bringing them in, putting them through the same process to the extent that they are able and willing to participate with us. Uh, a, another gap that we have in Salt Lake City is uh, our ability to refer for drug and alcohol treatment. Uh, we have set up a, a very uh, um, a streamlined system at this point through our uh, Salt Lake County Division of Behavioral Health, and uh, we are now about to start offering a diversion program that's called Alternatives to Treatment. And you'll see for uh, 2010, which is uh, the year that we have better, uh, the best records, that we served about 388 in individuals for 835 visits. These were uh, intense, uh, intensive visits. Uh, we do a lot more than is showing up on the surface. You're all aware of how you report to UDS and so forth in terms of uh, some of the things that you do that actually don't get counted. But these are countable face-to-face uh, uh, -face encounters. You'll see that anxiety disorders and uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, stress are, is very high. Uh, alcohol use is, is high. Uh, I still think it's uh, terribly underreported. Uh, we are doing some uh, tobacco uh, cessation, uh, I guess I shouldn't say cessation, but uh, uh, tobacco uh, treatment uh, uh, in terms of lowering tobacco. Um, and we're also offering uh, this uh, alternatives to treatment uh, process in a group setting uh, for our patients, and it's becoming uh, a very uh, efficacious in my estimation. So uh, there's a real advocacy aspect in what we're doing. Uh, again, I will stress that we are very lucky to have uh, been able to integrate the behavioral health money that we received. Uh, I'm one of the people who is uh, advocating very heavily for others of you who would like to get this money along with uh, the council and, and uh, the behavioral health field in general, I think, is beginning to clamor for uh, integration of behavioral health with primary health care. I think that this is the wave of the future. Um, I think that we're going to be uh, moving towards uh, reimbursement processes that are going to force us to integrate behavioral health care. Uh, here in Utah, we've had a very split and fragmented system. I'll use uh, Claire's earlier words about uh, fragmentation. 
to say that um, it was very difficult to uh, be able to get reimbursed for uh, the physical uh, process uh, in terms of integrating behavioral health care, and I think that we finally overcome that through our relationship with our Salt Lake County um, behavioral health system. Uh, with that information, I will turn the mic over to Dr. David Buck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, and everyone that uh, uh, is on the call and their interest in this. Uh, I'll be presenting a, uh, a very small thumbnail as uh, this is a very broad area, but hopefully it's a teaser and uh, we can follow up with more information. I'm uh, presenting from Houston, Texas with Health Care for the Homeless there. Uh, Houston's the fourth largest city in the nation and uh, the third most populous county in the nation. We uh, have uh, the largest uninsured population uh, in the country and have uh, more seriously mentally ill persons in Harris County than in any other county in, in the state. Roughly 80,000 adults unable to access care back in 2007 and since 2007 more than 40 percent cuts will have uh, raised that number significantly. We're the 50th of 50 states in terms of mental health spending. A uh, lack of care is due to insufficient funding, not surprising and not too different from other places. It's a crisis only system where there's very little uh, ambulatory access. And uh, the de facto mental health provider becomes the Harris County Jail for the largest number of patients. Uh, first, to give you the context of our clinic within Houston, or Harris County, we have three primary care clinics, one dental clinic, a project access bus to connect people to different uh, homeless services. We have medical street outreach, a jail inreach project, which I'll speak to in a moment, and um, we uh, our most common diagnosis is related to behavioral health problems, being either severe mental illness or drug and alcohol dependence. Uh, our approach, as uh, other speakers, including Alan, have alluded to, in, involves this integrated primary and behavioral health care model, and I'll speak to some details of that in a minute. The uh, clinics are all within shelters and uh, are all within the context of other service providers. So I'd like to share with you first our model of care, and I'm reminded by Gerta, as we should treat patients and treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and help them become what they are capable of being. Our integrated and goal-negotiated care focuses around our primary care clinics, where we have family medicine, family nurse practitioners, in-house psychiatry, as well as telepsychiatry, licensed chemical dependency counseling, counseling in terms of uh, social workers, as well as licensed marriage and family therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy, group therapy, chaplain, and uh, case managers. We uh, provide primary care and psychiatry through uh, the, the regular appointments, but also through telepsychiatry and co-appointments with the, their primary care provider as well as the psychiatrist for more challenging patients. This serves as a, a kind of backdoor to people that cannot get care or that other providers are frustrated with uh, elsewhere in the system and in our jail inreach project. There's really uh, two models of care within this and what, uh, as, as Alan, in his experience in Utah, he early, earlier shared with us, it has really helped to maintain provider and patient satisfaction, if, and in fact improve it, as well as improving retention. Because ultimately, behavioral health, uh, patients with behavioral health challenging conditions can be very challenging to uh, providers. 
but uh, training in this area can actually uh, provide uh, a great deal of satisfaction with uh, these otherwise challenging visits. We uh, frequently, to, to allow for this, we uh, have direct mentoring where we can uh, have the psychiatrist, behavioral health staff, or other family doctors uh, mentor other or newer staff members. We are very explicit about setting uh, endpoints, therapeutic endpoints, as well as psychopharmacology uh, endpoints at all visits. And through cognitive behavioral therapy and transactional analysis, we can help um, the, the, some of the game playing that occurs as a part of, of uh, some of the patients with behavioral health challenges. And I'll give an example of that uh, uh, in a moment. The uh, current primary care provider training includes teaching effectiveness with combined behavioral health care where there's both they, the, the behavioral health provider can sit in the room with the clinician. We can have uh, telepsychiatry as well as uh, coordination with behavioral health visits. Frequently, we'll introduce the behavioral health staff if they're not in the room already. And we have 24-7 psychiatry via telepsych. Um, to help us understand some of the common interactions and challenges and how to negotiate these interactions effectively, I'll share with you a concrete uh, patient case example, a 32-year-old male with bipolar disorder. The signs, the behavioral health signs, are they finish your sentences. They yell at the staff before they're even in the patient room. They're already directing traffic. They can't sit still. Uh, they refuse to answer any questions. And um, this particular patient has had a history of a head injury, which further um, complicates uh, frontal lobe problems, which um, uh, the uh, bipolar patient uh, suffers with, as well as substance abuse problems related to inadequate or in ineffective treatment. This may sound painfully familiar. Uh, do you call this place a clinic? Is somebody going to see me? Wow, Doc, I really like those shoes, and proceeds to try to take the shoes off of your feet. Uh, his behavior creates a sense of chaos in the clinic, and uh, he reports symptoms of four hours of sleep, racing thoughts, this constant irritability with rage, and substance abuse when meds are not controlling the mood. One of the uh, articles in the literature that has been very helpful is an old article from the Archives of General Psychiatry in 1970 by Janowski called Playing the Manic Game, which has been very helpful. So an approach of, of this type of patient, one is to look at the individual issues of the patient therapeutic encounter, but also the more transactional component uh, will uh, address briefly. So what is happening in this game playing, and how could it be shifted? Uh, and th what are our endpoints? Well, our endpoints are to improve his sleep, control thoughts and mood, decrease irritability. From a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective, is to help him understand what uh, behaviors are causing this problem that he blames himself for all this. But if we explain that this is uh, a part of the illness and that this is part of our job to work with him to try to help him to feel better, uh, it's often quite helpful. One of the quick tidbits that we often say is that if you have a side effect of the medicine, that don't blame you, blame us. The patients with bipolar illness tend to blame themselves for just about anything going wrong, but very few blame themselves for what's going right. So, um, oh, I'd like to um, give you one example. So to this case where the patient is saying, you know, do you call this place a clinic? One might say, uh, the provider might say, is this the way you treat people? Uh, we don't get angry with patients. You're coming here for help, and you're trying to make me angry. Would you like to, would you like me to point out situations and see if it might help you to change. 
I might, I'd like to ask you some questions. It may sound silly, but they may help me to understand you. But uh, moving on to the jail inreach project, uh, the jail inreach project goes into the jail and focuses on behavioral behavioral health uh, patients with behavioral health problems. Uh, their readmission rate is quite severe, and uh, because of a release policy where patients leave in the uh, 12:01 in the morning, where the only thing that's available is crack and prostitution, uh, and not their medications, it really helps to precipitate, if not maintain long-term, their behavioral health problems. So we try to um, track this and have good outcomes. Um, the case managers uh, have really made this program. They meet the mentally ill inmates in the jail and negotiate a plan for discharge in the daytime rather than at 12.01 in the morning. Uh, the lack of of discharges at 12.01 in the morning result in the possibility of continuity of care where they physically walk two blocks from the jail and we see the patient the same day and keep them on their meds. We began the program in September of 2009 and in uh, our evaluation showed a 56% reduction in total annual criminal charges. And of course, no uh, no talk would be uh, complete without some statistics, so I didn't want you to feel cheated. Uh, here are some of the statistics that talks about the uh, uh, outcomes of the uh, jail and reach project. So the activation of social services and health appears to decrease arrest rates and increase the possibility of transitioning out of homelessness. So as of course, we've just presented a very brief sketch of this and are developing now a curriculum of nine hours to uh, introduce this kind of training program of behavioral health um, integration. I'd now like to introduce Pia, Dr. Pia Valvasori uh, to continue. Thank you. My name is Pia. I am a clinician at the Healthcare Center for the Homeless in Orlando and a clinical professor at UCF. Um, this afternoon, what I'm going to be talking about is the integration model, and I'm going to start by giving you some information on the history of our particular program, discuss the number of patients served, and then I'll discuss the programs that are integral to our model. I'll also explain how this model is operationalized within our Healthcare for the Homeless program. Um, with regards to the history of our program, we opened in 1993 as a shelter-based clinic and over time received funding through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, later securing funding from HRSA to expand our programs and later um, received funding from the Community Developed Block Grant for our Behavioral Health Department. Some of the partnerships that we have in place include addiction services, both inpatient and outpatient. We're able to access specialty care through Orange County, which include a variety of different specialties, including cardiology, pulmonology, dermatology, everything with the exception of psychiatric services. Inpatient mental health services, we're also able to access those individuals that are acute. We have a number of academic partners. And for homeless, homeless and housing services, we work with our local network and a um, recuperative care setting as well. As far as the number of patients served, the next two slides will depict the number of patients at the healthcare center served over the last two years. And as you can see, there's been a large influx of patients through from 19, 2009 through 2010. Um, in addition, um, we've seen quite an additional influx of individuals who are housed or marginally housed. Our next slide, this is a graph just depicting the data we just noted. And the next slide, this demonstrates the cost-effective nature of our care, particularly as it relates to behavioral health and primary care. These numbers reflect the annual cost as well as per visit cost of care for our patients. The three programs I'm going to focus on include medical, behavioral health, and pharmacy. 
due to their collaborative relationship and the provision of integrated care. And as you can see, we offer a number of other programs as well within our project. Our primary care program, we have care provided by physicians, nurse practitioners, and a physician assistant. Our goal is to create a medical home to reduce the fragmentation of services and enhance continuity of care and reduce overall cost. Again, we have a collaboration with the county for the provision of specialty services, once again with the exception of psychiatric services. Our pharmacy services, we do have an in-house pharmacy that provides low-cost prescriptions. The majority of medications accessed through our behavioral health department are accessed through our patient assistance program. These medications include antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, and our patient assistance program in 2009 alone served 2,000 patients with a tremendous savings of over $2 million in prescription medications dispensed. Our behavioral health team consists of a nurse practitioner who specializes in psychiatry, who also has a collaborative relationship with a psychiatrist. We have two licensed mental health counselors, and their services include substance abuse counseling, crisis management, and again, psychiatric consultation as needed. Our rationale for integration has been cited in a number of studies, as noted below. In a study by Freese, nearly 70% of healthcare visits had a psychosocial basis. Two-thirds of homeless service users reported alcohol, drug, or mental illness. One-third of individuals have co-occurring depression that we commonly see. And half of all common mental health disorders are seen in primary care. In a study conducted by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Clinicians Network, half of all mental health disorders went undiagnosed in primary care. Some of the reasons for this are as follows. The barriers to integration. The barriers um, that I'm going to discuss in the following come from four different perspectives. From the disease process, the patient perspective, the provider perspective, and finally, from a systems perspective. From the disease process perspective, mental illness encompasses a wide spectrum of diseases. And oftentimes, there's limited knowledge of the pathophysiology involved. Many of the individuals have nonspecific presentations. For example, they have complaints of fatigue, malaise, body pain. Those are just some of the many examples. Their diagnoses are based on lengthy histories. And their symptoms are oftentimes very chronic and complex. From a patient standpoint, many of the individuals we see have multiple comorbidities. It's not uncommon to see individuals with hypertension, diabetes, COPD, and hepatitis C. In addition, as noted earlier, there is a stigma of seeking behavioral health, the stigma of being considered crazy. Symptoms oftentimes discourage care seeking. And many individuals are concerned about follow-up. They're concerned about ongoing care, continuity, and they develop trust with their behavioral health team. Other barriers from the provider perspective, providers are oftentimes trained within the medical model. They have competing demands on their time. They have, they have so much information that they're trying to process. They're not adequately trained in behavioral medicine. And some are not interested in behavioral medicine. Oftentimes, there's competing, tr competing treatment modalities. Examples are where the primary care provider and the behavioral health provider might not concur on a particular treatment plan. From a systems perspective, there's little monetary incentive for the provision of behavioral health services. There are time constraints. Measuring outcomes is oftentimes a challenge. These outcomes are poorly defined. They're difficult to quantify. And it's difficult to follow patients on a long-term basis. There may be limited access to expertise and limited capacity to treat. And finally, problems with interfacing electronic health record systems. This can further fragment care. The advantages to implementing integrated model of care include improved outcomes, enhanced patient compliance with their medical treatment plan, lower cost. We see a lower morbidity and mortality rates with a reduction in emergency room visits. We see enhanced access for patient, timely treatment. They're, less in, they're more inclined to engage in their care. We have an improved rate of patient satisfaction, as well as with our primary care providers, are much more satisfied. 
they feel as if the burden is taken off of them, particularly in crisis situations where our behavioral health team is readily accessible. And finally, this model of care conserves scarce resources. Overcoming some of the barriers at the healthcare center, what we have found that our primary care providers collaborate with our behavioral health team in individuals with multiple comorbidities. The primary care providers obtain detailed histories in collaboration with our behavioral health staff. The primary care providers have been educated on behavioral health related topics and they encourage patients to follow up frequently to enhance compliance and oftentimes to assess treatment responses to medications initiated by our psychiatric nurse practitioner. Patients are readily able to access medications, costs is deferred through our patient assistance program, and being able to access the behavioral health team in a crisis situation once again takes tremendous stress off our primary care providers. One of the things we're still attempting to overcome are interfacing information systems in an effort to reduce fragmentation and reduce duplication of services. I'm now going to present a case study which demonstrates the efficacy of this model at our particular center. Mrs. C is a 45-year-old woman with diabetes and hypertension residing at a local shelter. She's non-compliant with her medication re regimen and has experienced weight gain, which has further exacerbated her diabetes. She's depressed, doesn't sleep, and uses food as a means to cope. After undergoing an evaluation by her primary care provider, she was referred for counseling and subsequent medical management of her depression to our psychiatric nurse practitioner. She was immediately able to access our pharmacy services for her medications and has continued to receive them through our patient assistance program. Over time, she has lost weight, is sleeping, and is much more engaged in her treatment plan. Her primary care provider and psychiatric nurse pr practitioner have collaboratively developed a successful plan of care. And finally, <clears throat> some of the future directions at the healthcare center as it pertains to our integrated model of care. Our intent is to successfully implement evidence-based practices, to enhance the quality of care standards, to formalize training for our primary care providers, to cultivate funds for technical assistance and a care coordinator, to implement formalized team meetings among our behavioral health and medical staff, and finally, we will strive to exemplify the best practices in integration. Now I will turn it over to Barbara. Thank you, Pia, and thank you, everyone, for presenting what your models look like in, in, in your community health centers. Um, I'd like to turn it over right now to uh, our listeners and see what kinds of questions you might be having, especially after listening to a variety of different approaches that have been tried uh, and implemented in local uh, health care for the homeless projects. Uh, here are a couple of questions that you might be thinking about, but uh, this might be either for now or for the kinds of conversations that you might be having back with your teams. Uh, how can services be better integrated at your site? How might a team-oriented approach either be created if you haven't yet started that process, or how might it be strengthened if you started it and maybe there's some pieces still uh, missing or, or still some training that you might consider? Where are the opportunities for better integration? Uh, where can you start with the lowest hanging fruit? Uh, how might any funding opportunities that's coming through HRSA be maximized with regard to integrating care, adding new services, and seeing how interdisciplinary work uh, might be implemented? Or any other questions that you might have as you've been listening to our speakers and thinking about how this might be reflected in your, in your reality. So with this, I'll turn it over to Julie, uh, just as a way of perhaps whetting our appetite for some of the things that our listeners might be considering. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, presenters. I will begin the Q&A session. Um, we did get a few questions in, and I know um, some more are being submitted right now. So I'll go ahead and start with the first question. Um, I will um, ask Alan from Yvonne, do the residential drug abuse or drug and alcohol treatment centers have beds set aside specifically for the homeless population. Alan? Thank you. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, 
the question is about uh, having beds set aside for homeless patients. Uh, we are able to directly refer our homeless patients to about five different drug and alcohol treatment facilities. There's, there's not a specific bed set aside, but we do have strong relationships with all publicly supported uh, drug and alcohol treatment centers that are funded through the state by, uh, uh, by way of the county uh, division of behavioral health. Uh, we also have um, recuperative beds or, or uh, respite care beds that we use in conjunction with this uh, with people coming in and out of treatment. I hope that's a uh, sufficient answer to the question. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, the next question uh, will be for David from Larry. Do patients often see both primary care and behavioral health providers on the same visit? David? Okay. Uh, yes, that's the ideal. I'd say about 80% of the time that's what happens. Um, either through telepsychiatry, it can happen the same day, so the provider, uh, the primary care provider introduces the behavioral health specialist, or uh, they are introduced to a live behavioral health specialist um, that's in the same clinic. That's the ideal model. And then also um, what we're trying to do is work towards the model where there's a behavioral health team that tries to engage every patient that comes in to address some of the issues related to stigma so that everyone gets exposed to the behavioral health resources. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. Um, our next question, um, the other presenters might have a response and they will uh, let me know, but I will start with Pia. Um, this question is from Tom. Do any of the programs highlighted um, utilize pharmaceutical industry funded patient assistance programs for the psychotropic medications prescribed to patients? Hi, this is Pia. Yes, we predominantly do access our patient assistance programs for um, psychotropics, um, just by virtue of their cost and inability to access them in our in-house pharmacy. Thank you, Pia. And I believe um, Alan had a comment response. Alan? I'd like to say that we use the uh, various patient assistance programs very, very heavily here in Salt Lake City. Uh, we, we leverage about $1.8 million overall, and I'm not sure what percentage of that is uh, psychotropic medications, but every medication that our patients need, uh, we, we can pretty much get access to through the uh, indigent drug programs. Back to you, Julie. Yeah, also depend heavily on the PAP program as well for all our psychotropics. We use a Class D pharmacy, but use uh, uh, much of the PAP program to, to pay for them. Uh, our next question is from Helen. Um, I will start with um, Alan. Do you work with any interim housing providers, such as respite care providers, in providing integrated services to homeless clients? Uh, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but let me see if I can, uh, can uh, give you an answer and, and uh, you can get back to me if, if I'm not on target. Uh, we have a respite care uh, program in addition to integrated, care, uh, integrated behavioral health care, and we do uh, pass patients back and forth uh, to, from respite care to uh, our uh, on-site integrated behavioral health system. Um, we also do home visits. We've created about 550 permanent supportive housing units in Salt Lake in the last three and a half years. And one of the things that we're noticing is that people, when people get into permanent supportive housing, they will often uh, close the door and uh, become uh, essentially antisocial. Uh, they continue their depression. So we actually do home visits, knock on doors, uh, engage people from a behavioral health standpoint. Often it's our, pr our primary care provider who does this, but if we see a problem, we also engage our uh, behavioral health specialist in this process. So there uh, is, I, I won't say it's a fully integrated system between uh, recuperative or respite care and uh, uh, housing, but uh, we're trying our best to uh, continue to integrate that system. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, our 
it looks like our last question, um, I will direct this to Pia from Larry. How does an integrated system best respond to post-acute discharges for a psychiatric or substance abuse hospitalization? Pia? Hi, this is Pia. Yeah, post-discharge situations, typically people will come and present in the primary care clinic whereby their medical records will be reviewed and then we will promptly consult with our psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, bridge them accordingly and provide, you know, um, put together a plan of care for that individual patient. Great, thank you. Okay, we did receive um, one last question. And this is from Yvonne. And it's asking, are any of you working with Native American homeless population? I know there's the Fort um, Dechan Reservation by SLC, and Texas has a large Native American population. Thank you. This is a really good question. Um, we have a fairly large Native American population in the general Southwest, uh, Utah being uh, uh, part of the Southwest. Um, and we have a, a full-time uh, outreach person who is Navajo speaking, uh, who specializes in trying to uh, work with uh, uh, homeless people who are Native American. Uh, there's a huge issue in terms of people leaving reservations because of lack of employment, a large uh, alcohol and drug uh, uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, we do see a lot of urban Native Americans in our in Salt Lake and in Denver, in Albuquerque, certainly in Los Angeles and other places. So this is a, a huge area that we need to continue to uh, reach out uh, to the extent that we possibly can do this with one person, we do this. Uh, and uh, we also try our best to integrate uh, people into our clinical setting, although they tend to not want to come to the clinic for services. So uh, we do as, as much as we can uh, on site. Uh, we do have one particular uh, substance abuse, uh, a publicly funded substance abuse treatment center that specializes in Native Americans. Uh, very difficult to reach population. Uh, we try to be culturally competent, but there are so many different kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, cultures within the Native American population that that's a very difficult thing to do. I'll turn this back over to Julie. All right, thank you so much. Um, I do want to thank everyone um, for joining the HCH Models of Integrated Care webinar produced by the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. And I also want to um, thank the presenters. This meeting will now be closed.